Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us caring for a loved one with memory loss. So with me today is Dr. Philip Dion. He is a neurologist, but he's also an author. He has a course, he has an app, and he also is part of the Inley Brain Fit Institute. So I don't think he has time to sleep. So very happy to have you on the podcast today. You were telling me offline you became interested in neurology because of your grandmother and your cousin. So maybe that's a good place to start. Well, thank you for having me. Um, and thank you for allowing me to be here just to share, share a little bit about my story. So, so yeah, when I was younger, uh, I had a cousin who had epilepsy. And then my grandmother developed dementia uh, and was later diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And she was really the matriarch of the family. I mean, every Saturday, uh, myself, my parents, my aunts and uncles, the rest of my cousins would always go over there for family dinners. And it was just a really great place to just kind of be and have fun and share the stories of our week together. Um, but once she started to develop some cognitive issues, that all began to change. And uh, those family dinners just really stopped happening over a period of time. And to see this woman who was so incredibly strong, who kept the family together, um, who traveled from another country, brought her family here so they can have a better life for themselves. And to see how her Alzheimer's really started to, to rob her of her identity and her life was really tough to see. Um, but, but at the same time, it got me really interested in the brain because I started to really think about how, well, when the brain does work the way that it's supposed to, it actually really does allow people to create the life that they want. And neurological disorders in general affect people like no other disorders do because it affects people physically, emotionally, cognitively, mentally. Um, and so that's really what sort of inspired me to, to go into neurology. That's a good inspiration. I don't think I mentioned to you, my maternal grandmother, she had a brain aneurysm that leaked for three months. So I'm sure you can uh, understand the... Uh, with the negative impact on her brain with that. So I'm assuming that she ended up with either vas like vascular dementia, because she ended up the same way my mom did, or my mom ended up like her mom. And my mom was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And we kind of had the same thing. It was like she was the one that, you know, we always got together for holidays. And, you know, like we probably would have had a family get together you know, over Labor Day and once she got sick and my grandfather ended up with cancer so that after they passed away it's like the family just kind of scattered to the four corners even though we're all pretty much in the northern california so i can i can understand how that the loss of the family getting together and we didn't do it weekly but that could have been nice <laughs> yeah no it was it was a, a great time for us you know it was a great time to, to spend with my cousins aunts and uncles uh, she would spoil us with, with her favorite candies, <laughs> and she, which was probably part of the problem, actually, <laughs> that she loved candy. Um, she loved her sugar. But uh, oh, That was my mom, too. My mom would actually crack teeth on things like sugar daddies, caramels, hard uh, candies. I mean, yeah. once my daughter had a baby tooth, it just, I don't know what was holding it in. And so my mom gave her... Um, the starburst, which you know are just sticky, gooey candy, and it still didn't pull the stupid tooth out. But <laughs> that was my mom. My mom always had sugar readily available, and she was a huge Diet Coke drinker. Two yeah, liters was, of Diet Coke every day. Yeah, my grandmother loved her caramel. That was her favorite candy. She always uh, had that. Now I'm wanting caramel. <laughs> I had to learn to bake and eat a lot less sugar because we have like my maternal grandfather did not feel a meal was complete until they had dessert. I don't know if that applied to breakfast, but it did apply to lunch and dinner. So I, I feel very confident in stating that I have an inherited sweet tooth <laughs> that I've had to wrestle to the ground to keep under control. <laughs> and it's not easy. 
you know, I've had, I've had like nutritionists say, well, just, just quit cold turkey and my family will be like, oh, no, 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 no. She will kill somebody. No, no, we don't do that. <laughs> we'll, we'll limit it in small quantities, but no cold turkey. No, that, that stuff is addictive just like any hardcore drug is. Right? So it operates and changes the chemicals in your brain in the same way. That's interesting. I did know that, but it's still interesting to hear again because – I really do get a little hostile if I don't have my sugar, <laughs> but I don't have to have it nearly in, in the quantity that I used to. I went on a weight loss journey a decade ago, and obviously one does not lose weight if you don't wrestle your sweet tooth to the ground. So, That's true. So I, and then after learning, well, we also, my dad's side of the family has a huge um, medical history of diabetes which uh, that was the biggest reason for the weight loss journey. Cause I was like, I am not going down that path. Nope. And then I learned after losing all the weight that sugar is really, really bad for your brain, not just for diabetes. So I feel like I really did myself a, a solid by learning to eat better. Yeah. And you know, I think a lot of times people don't realize that the impact that food has on their overall health, but especially the health of their brain. Right. I mean, it, like you said, sugar is not good for the brain. Mm -mm. Uh, processed foods, high carbs food trigger a lot of inflammation in our body, but also within our, our nervous system. And we, we just call it neuroinflammation. And when you look at um, just over the last 30 years, some of the diseases that have increased, it's diabetes and Alzheimer's. And there is a link there. Right? So a lot, of, a lot of neuroscientists will tell you um, that Alzheimer's disease is almost like type three diabetes because it's such a close association. Yeah. I've heard that and read about it and it makes me very glad that I decided to change the direction of my health by, well, what, what happened was I had a client who was a doctor and she said, Oh, you have a family history of diabetes. You're significantly overweight. You're screwed. Well, those were some good words because it was like, oh, I'll show you. I am not screwed. I will figure this out. And so it took a lot of effort to figure out what, what nutritional path worked to keep the weight off, to lose it and to keep most of it off. Turning 50 and my dad going on hospice and then having to take care of my mom, none of that stuff helped, but I'm working on it. <laughs> I have the age-related weight gain, which is no fun. So let's see. How long have you been a doctor of neurology? Oh, so uh, I graduated medical school in 2007. Uh, so I became an attending, I think it was 2013, 2012, 2013. All those years blur together, don't they? <laughs> they do blur together. <laughs> you Doesn't... lose your 20s and 30s and... It, you know, in the hospital. So <laughs> I believe it. I used to photograph the UC Davis surgical residence graduate black tie dinner. And there was usually four or five of them. And they were so impressed. You'd read their little bios in the program and it'd be like, I think I'll just leave now because I'm, I'm not worthy of being in the same room with these people. So they would do like fellowships in Africa and all kinds of just like impressive things and a lot of them were like early 30s and they had young kids and spouses and it was like i don't know how these people have any time to do anything <laughs> <laughs> so it's definitely not an easy path so but while you were doing that path you you came up with a few other little things just to unless you did all these during quarantine <laughs> which came first the app the book the course so the app came first um then, so the, the app came at the end of 2018. The book I published uh, in April of 2019. And the course is actually getting ready to launch on Monday. Monday, so that would be the... The 7th. 7th, okay. Yeah. Awesome. Well, it's always fun to like get in on the... Right, right at the very beginning. So which one do you want to talk about first? Oh, I guess we'll take it in order. So we'll go with the uh, app. <laughs> okay, that works for me. I'm a creative person, but on the half of me is very creative and half of me is very um, business, like everything's got to be squared away. So I'm a unique, I have a unique brain because I'm like 
unlike my sister and my dad who were Geminis, I am not a Gemini, but I do have like almost split personality with, I'm not like this messy artist or the really um, A type personality. I have like a combination that's equal parts. So it's, I used to not like it. I always wanted to be more artist than business person. And then I learned to embrace the, the benefit of being like a 50-50. <laughs> So how did you come up with, the app is, um, it's games, right? Yeah, so the app is called Dr. Dion's Brain Fit. And, um, you know, I think people would be surprised to hear that even as a neurologist, most of the people I see with neurological issues, it's because of the impact of preventable chronic diseases on their brain, as opposed to a primary brain disorder. So it's the impact of diabetes, high blood pressure, sedentary lifestyle, not eating healthy, alcohol on the brain. And so a lot of these things are things that are within our control, right? And so when people come to see me, we're always having discussions about what's going on in their life, what do they do during their day to day, how much physical activity are they getting, what kind of foods are they eating, how much are they sleeping? And so I thought of all a really great way to teach people would be through a game. Right? You want to sort of meet people where they're at, and people are always looking at their phones anyway. That's true. Um, <laughs> right? And so you can, you know, create a game that is both fun um, as well as it, it, it sort of teaches them. And so I modeled this game called Dr. Dion's uh, Brain Fit um, after sort of Candy Crush and made it like a medical Candy Crush. And so there's uh, 40 levels to the game. Each level represents a different disease state. So level one starts with sedentary lifestyle and level 40 ends with Alzheimer's. And uh, throughout the levels, you're matching healthy foods and healthy activities. And every five or six matches or so, there's a question that comes up that's related to that particular level, that particular disease state. And the questions aren't about medications. It's, it's all about things that people can do every single day to really change how their brains evolve. That's really interesting. And I laugh a little bit because my husband is still playing Candy Crush. However, many years later, I don't know what level he's on, like 5,000 and something or whatever. It's insane. <laughs> I have moved on to other games, but <laughs> I like variety. So I, after a while, it's like, it gets to the point where you have to spend money to beat the levels. I'm like, eh, done with that. Let's move on to something different. So I'm definitely going to check that out and show him because... He's such a Candy Crush fanatic. Um, he eats okay. We're, we're pretty physically active. We just did a 30-mile bike ride with our cycle club this morning. Uh -huh. And he was the one that was like, let's do some extra hills. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, you know, it's really easy to talk yourself out of it because he went on the same weight loss journey and then he put a lot of it back on. And so it's really easy to talk yourself out of doing hills, especially for me. I, I start up the hill and next thing I'm breathing really heavy. My legs don't hurt. It's not a, it's not a function of muscles. I don't, I guess it's, it's obviously the extra weight hauling it up the hill, but you know, once you do it, you're like, Hey, I did it. See, I knew I could do it. You just have to not talk yourself out, not convince yourself that you can't do it. Cause I, I suggested a hill. We used to have to climb to get home before we moved this year. And he's like, oh, no, 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 no. And I'm like, you know you can do that hill. And he's like, yeah, I do. I'm like, okay, we're going to do that one. And then in the next week or so, I have a friend who's a neuropsychologist. He just finished his doctoral program and is the internship for his doctoral program. And so he just started working last month. And he realized that he's getting a little too old to play basketball. So he bought a bike. And... He was like, I really want to jump on, it was on Twitter. I really want to jump on the bike, but it's starting to get dark earlier. And I, I encouraged him to get on the bike and just ride a little bit. And then I said, you know, yeah, I guess he's got to study for some horrendous exam this Labor Day weekend. And I said, okay, after Labor Day, the three of us, we're going to have like a Twitter cycling challenge. And so I sent him the map of our ride this morning and now he's, he's motivated. <laughs> so, you know, challenging yourself is also helpful yep. you know so and then so the app can we find that on all you the two app stores on, yeah you can find it uh on the app store uh on google play um, so yeah they're available 
both in, the, in the usual spots. Mm-hmm. Okay, so after you after you tackled becoming a neurologist and creating an app, then you decided, oh, what the heck, I'll just write a book too. <laughs> yeah, you know, so I always had this goal that I wanted to um, write and, and publish a book by the time I was 40. And so um, I wrote this book, Neuroplasticity, Your Brain Superpower, really to teach people about the fact that our brains are constantly changing. And we used to think that our brains were static, that we were born with a certain amount of neurons and that the only changes that could potentially take place is that as we get older and if we develop dementia or or, or Alzheimer's, we may lose neurons, or if we have some kind of head injury, we may lose neurons. But now we know that that's not the case at all, that we have the ability to constantly make new neurons and new connections. And so I really wanted to, to teach people about that because that has implications for everything that happens in our life. Our ability to learn new skills, whether that's learning how to play a new instrument, learning how to uh, play a new sport, picking up a new uh, hobby, learning a new language. That all happens because of our brain's ability to make new neurons. That's how we learn, right? And mm-hmm. even after an injury to the brain, the brain is capable of a tremendous amount of healing. Uh, because it's able to make new neurons and new connections. And so that also gives people a lot of hope so that if you've had a stroke or a traumatic brain injury, um, that you can continue to get better as long as you're giving your brain what it needs in order for it to to thrive. And so dynamic learning is the way of increasing the neurons in your brain. Yeah, actually, the, the most powerful thing that you can do to increase the neurons in your brain is exercising, physical exercise. So, Aim for that 30-mile bike ride this morning. <laughs> yeah, it, you know, it, it's incredibly important. And what we do know is that people who live sedentary lifestyles, they actually start to lose neurons, and they're at really uh, greater risk for developing dementia. Uh, but being physically active and exercising, you're giving your brain everything it needs to be able to create new nerve cells and new connections. So it's really, really important. Um, Along with that goes making sure you're eating healthy, um, making sure you're getting enough sleep because that's when the brain is really doing a lot of its healing, minimizing stress because stress actually kills neurons, especially in the parts of the brain responsible for memory, uh, especially short-term memory. Um, And you wanna constantly be learning, right? And learning can look like anything. So it could look like what we just mentioned but it could also look like having different conversations with different people who have a completely different worldview than you do. It doesn't mean that you have to agree with them, but their perspective allows your brain to make new neurons and new connections. That makes sense. That's actually really interesting. And with the exercise, you don't have to like become a crazy cyclist like I did. Walking is actually a really good brain yep. exercise, isn't it? Yeah, walking is, is a really good brain exercise. And actually studies do show that for people who are starting to develop some memory problems or some cognitive impairments, if they walk 30 to 40 minutes a day at moderate intensity, that that helps improve their memory. Right? And there's also been studies that have shown, you know how like when, when we're in school, like we all cram until the very last minute before we have to take a test. We try to, you know, put as much in and we don't really care if, it, if yeah. that information passed the test. We just want to yeah. be brain, to the test. Brain dump for the test and then move on. <laughs> right. And, but studies show that you're better off going for a run an hour before the test than cramming in the information. You'll remember more. Interesting. One of the things I do when I'm writing articles for my website is I actually listen to nature sounds. That It's very, very quiet in the background, but it... I. I find like, cause I like the oh, surprise. I like to listen to people talk. So I like to listen to podcasts, but you can't do that while you're writing unless you want to write a bunch of gibberish and music. Uh, instrumental music generally kind of makes me want to go to sleep. And I found that nature sounds just in the background. You're not almost not even aware of them. Just really kind of like, it's like it must fire up another part of the brain besides what's working on the writing. Because I find it really beneficial if I listen to nature sounds while I'm writing, which is kind of new. I'd read an article about if you listen to classical music while you were reading, you retain things better. And well, I appreciate classical music, but it's definitely not my first choice. Yeah. So I'm hoping to translate 
classical music to nature sounds. And there's a lot of benefits of nature, you know, the healing aspects of nature. So hopefully the sounds are, give you at least a little bit benefit. Yeah. And, and look, sounds and especially music, they light up so many different parts of our brains, right? I mean, if, if we think about it, you, you're listening to music. So it lights up the parts of the brain that are responsible for hearing. Um, oftentimes there's words in music. So the parts of the brain responsible for language. You've got people who, when they hear music, they actually see things like different colors. Um, so music can light up the occipital lobe, which is responsible for vision. A lot of people, once they hear a sound, they'll sort of unconsciously start to sway to the beat, right? Um, so we don't just listen to music with our ears. We also listen to music with, with our muscles and the parts of our brains that are responsible uh, for movement. So it really lights up a lot of our brain. So maybe a little dancing around the house would be a good uh, exercise so brain a, stimulant. <laughs> yeah, it's a great, great exercise. It's a great way to, to sort of influence your mood, right? And, and look, companies know this. I mean, they play music in stores to get us to shop more, to get us to spend more money. <laughs> so... That's true. You don't hear a lot of uh, gangster rap at the mall. <laughs> yeah, no. So, that probably yeah. would not stimulate a lot of purchases. Right. Well, it might for some groups, but not 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 mine. <laughs> <laughs> so, what other kinds of things should we consider so that we're constantly creating new neurons? Which that's a tongue twister in our brains as we age, because you know nobody wants to nobody wants to end up with alzheimer's and a lot of people that i've talked to they're with the blood test that is coming they're like oh i don't think i want to know and i'm like but there are things you can change that might slow the progression down so it's i can relate i have three generations of memory loss my mom my grandmother and my maternal great-grandmother so i've seen it i know how ugly it is but i will probably find out if i'm at risk and I, I probably, I will, I'm a little more willing because I don't feel like I'm at risk other than the um, genetic component, if there is one. I'm not sure how, how well they know. I guess the genetic risk gives you a little bump, but it's not like a cancerous risk. I don't know how much they know about that one. You can fill me in if I'm, I think I'm, I think I'm blundering that one pretty well. <laughs> well. And this is what I always tell people, that genetics is not equal destiny. And just because somebody, something runs in your family, there's a disease that runs in your family, doesn't mean that you have to get it. And in fact, what, you should, what we should all be more concerned about is not the changes in the genes that put us at risk, but it's what we learn about our health from our family that really puts us at risk, right? So if our families, we learned how to eat in ways that are not healthy, we carry that into adulthood. Yep. That predisposes us to dementia and to Alzheimer's more than our genes do, right? If we learn that, look, we can be sedentary our entire lives. We don't have to exercise. Well, that's going to put us at significant risk of dementia and Alzheimer's as we get older. So it's really about what we're learning from our family that puts us at, at, at greater risk than the actual gene itself does. Good to know. My mom never had to worry about her weight. She could eat all the candy that she wanted and pretty much whatever food she wanted and didn't gain weight. Whereas I walk past a nice marbled steak and <laughs> my body's like, Oh, we'll just store that right here. And so I had to learn, let's see. So I was early forties when I went on this big weight loss journey. So I feel like I changed my destiny by doing that and I sleep better and happier the beginning of this year with the pandemic and you know california decided oh let's 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 have it rain as soon as the governor says everybody needs to stay home that was that was beneficial but after a while it was you know the gyms are closed and i couldn't go out on my bike rides and i was like i finally had to like dig through a box to find the part to put my bike on the trainer so i could ride my bike as a stationary bike because i'm like i am stressed I am feeling homicidal. I need to burn off some steam and it worked. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it's amazing how, you know, 
good a good sweat session really reduces your stress which i've had people say well i've done boxing i've done this and it just makes me more aggressive and i'm like mm, i'm not sure that you're doing it right but most people find exercise burns off stress yeah and it certainly does and and stress you know we're, we're built for short-term stress but chronic stress has a really horrible impact on every aspect of our body including our brains and do they know exactly what it is that stress does to our brain? Yep. So when, um, when we're stressed out, let's say a lion walks into this room. Like that's going to be a really stressful event for me, right? Yeah, it'll probably be a little stressful on this side of the camera too. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, my, my brain and body wants me to survive. And so it's going to increase certain chemicals like cortisol and adrenaline right? Uh, it's going to increase the adrenaline to get my blood pressure up, to get more heart pumping to my muscles so I can either run or to fight. My <laughs> heart is going to go up to compensate for that. My breathing is going to go up to compensate for that. You know, cortisol is going to go up in the brain so that way I can focus on that threat. So I can focus on that lion, focus on posture, um, where it is in the room, if it looks like it wants to eat me in the moment or not, <laughs> where the exit signs are, you know, and so, and, but that's for me to sort of survive in that moment. But when you're chronically under stress, then, and those chemicals are elevated, right? That means that now you're developing high blood pressure, which has a negative impact on the brain, right? Your heart rate is all over the place, which isn't great. Um, cortisol goes up, which, which decreases your immune system, puts you at risk of developing obesity and diabetes but it also kills neurons in the brain. So a lot of times when we see people who are um, under stress, they actually are not making new memories. And in fact, if, this, if a lion walks into this room, I'm so focused on the lion that I'm not making any new memories. And so two weeks from now, if I survive, and I say to somebody, I'm telling them this story, and they say, well, what were you doing in that place? I may not even remember. <laughs> because I didn't make that memory because in the moment that that was not important, what was important was escaping that line. And so if you take that and apply that to people who are chronically under stress, people who have gone through significant traumas, right? They're always focused on the trauma, always yeah. focused on that threat, whether it is happening in the moment or not, they are not making uh, new memories to compensate for that, that trauma in their past. Which is one of the reasons that we really need to work on systemic racism because that's yep. very toxic to the, you know, the communities that suffer from that. Yeah. So, so, you know, traumas like racism have a significant impact, right? And if people are chronically under stress, it increases their risk of preventable chronic diseases. It has a negative impact on their brain. Um, it keeps them focused on, on the traumas that are occurring either today or in the past. Yeah, because it's like a lot of them don't ever seem to end. It's like we're just rolling from one trauma to another. Yeah. It's awful. So there was a question that I had, and it's trying to escape my brain. I hate that. They're talking about um, stress. Oh, shoot. I hate it when my brain cell dies. <laughs> I had a professor in college. He would lecture, talk, 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 talk. It was an evening class. Talk, talk, and then all of a sudden he'd stop. And he'd look around, and he'd look at his notes, and then he'd go, oh, well, that brain cell died. And then he'd go on to like a different topic within the course, and we'd be like, whoa, uh, hello, um, is that like half lecture going to be on the test? Because he didn't really finish it. So, um well, talk about how I just recently learned how while we're sleeping, the brain kind of files away all of the memories from the day. So it like, like it yeah. does its memory housekeeping. But then I also read where it, um, they think, and you would obviously know this a lot better than me, that that's also when your brain's like clearing away the, the plaques and it's the tau and the plaques, right? Yeah, so essentially, so sleep is really designed for the brain. Right. I mean, that is the time where your brain is doing everything it needs to keep itself as healthy as possible. So it is clearing out the toxins that are building up from the work that the brain is doing throughout the day. And in fact, we all have uh, cerebral spinal fluid. So this clear fluid that bathes our brain and our spinal cord, 
It keeps the brain buoyant, so that way our brains are not pushed up against the skull. It plays a role in the brain in the brain's immunity. But one of the things that they've also seen is that during the deeper stages of sleep, you get pulses of waves of this fluid, and it's thought mm. that those pulses sort of correlate with clearing out toxins during that time. We also know that. You know, when people are entering into deeper stages of sleep, that's when your brain's consolidating memory. That's when it's taking the things that you've learned throughout the day and filing them away, like you, like you said, so that way we remember them long term. During those deeper stages of sleep, that's when your brain's making new neurons and making new connections. It's releasing chemicals like brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which allows that process to happen. So I have a friend who has like chronic insomnia. And her mom, who was very healthy, exercised, maintained proper weight, did all the stuff what we've mentioned previously, she still ended up with dementia. And I suspect that a lot of it was due to the insomnia. Because I know it's like she has good good days where she's gotten plenty of sleep. We saw her. She's part of our cycle club. She and another gal from the club had been riding before the biggest part of our group started this morning. And she was obviously well rested because she was just flying down the road. (laughs) But then there's days when she doesn't get out riding because she hasn't had enough sleep. And so is there, what can people who, I don't have this problem, thankfully. What can people with like chronic insomnia, what should they be doing? Knowing that how important sleep is for our brain. I mean, obviously you don't want to take, you know, alcohol disrupts your sleep. You feel it makes you sleepy. What, what, go ahead. And so, you know, like you sort of alluded to, we know that if you're sleep deprived in your forties, fifties, and sixties, you're more likely to develop Alzheimer's in your seventies, eighties, and nineties. That's how important uh, sleep is. And so, you know, what people really need to be doing is improving their sleep hygiene. And by sleep hygiene, what I mean is, they need to be getting their bodies ready to go to sleep. So turn off the TV an hour before you go to bed. There shouldn't be any electronics in the room, no, no TV, no phones. Um, you want to not eat two to three hours before you go to bed because the digestive process can interfere with sleeping. And depending on what you're eating, it could be a stimulant. Right? You want to, uh, when the evening comes, you want to dim down the lights. You don't want to have every light on in your house because the reality is that our brains respond to light. And so when, uh, you know, it starts becoming evening time, we start releasing melatonin, which is really a way of telling our bodies, look, you need to, you need to start getting ready for sleep. And when the lights come on, we release more serotonin, which is kind of like, all right, it's time to wake up. Okay. You want to um, stay away from stimulants like coffee, uh, you, you know, if you're going to have coffee, you probably shouldn't have any eight hours before you go to sleep because that can stay in your system for a really, really long time. Um, oh, that's my, I, that's my guilty pleasure. I do. I drink tea, which has a lot less caffeine than yeah. coffee still has caffeine, but I don't usually drink too much. Try to try to limit it at least 90 minutes before bed, if not two hours. Mostly that's because I don't like to have to get up and use the bathroom three times a night. That disrupts my sleep. I don't like that. And, and caffeine like never chamomile. seems to have a problem though. Yeah. And, but tea like chamomile tea can actually help you fall asleep. That's true. I do have one that's called relax mm-hmm. and it's just, I'm not really big on the herbal teas because to me, they taste a lot like boiled grass. <laughs> <laughs> Even mixed with, like, I'll, I'll make iced tea that's got some herbal and some, like, flavored herbal, like mango, and then um, with the black tea, and the even the hint of the herbal tea, it's just, there's, it, it, like, when you, it's like drinking wine, the finish as it goes down your throat is not the same, so yeah. that's, it's like, can only give up so many things, but I, I do, do limit all I drink is tea and water. So I do limit what I drink before bed just so that I'm not going to the bathroom five times a night. Cause that's no fun. Yeah. Um, I do listen to podcasts to go to sleep. Cause if I'm not listening, I found in our old house with a TV in the bedroom and I would fall asleep to, I could fall asleep to 
you know, Stephen Colbert, even though it was funny, it's the melodic rhythm of voices speaking. And it just lulls me into a sense of sleep. And then the commercial comes on, it wakes you up. And so I just learned to, I just, I put my phone in the nightstand drawer and close it so I don't get any of that light. And I'm listening to the people talking and literally in five minutes, I'm out. I can listen to the same podcast all week and not hear the whole thing. <laughs> and it works wonders. If I, and there's times I'm like, ugh, I really want to actually listen to this while I'm awake. And then I'll just lay there. And I'm like, after 10, 15 minutes, I'm like, oh, forget it. I'll just listen to it now and then I'll listen to it when I'm awake. <laughs> so that's my only, those are my two little negatives on, on the list that you said we should do. But keep the room cooler, even though I like it warm. Not for sleeping, though. Um, Taking warm showers can help to relax the muscles and help you help you relax in general, right? So that gets you ready to sleep. Um, so there are things that people can do every day, and the reality is that while sleep medications may help you fall asleep, over time they can actually disrupt your ability to get into the deeper stages of sleep. And so, uh, you know, just changing one or two things when it comes to your overall sleep hygiene may be a lot more beneficial. Have you found with um, people that you're people that you treat who are living with Alzheimer's, there's a lot of times their clock gets completely yeah. out of whack. Um, my mom started getting this way. The caregivers would tell me, Oh yeah, she gets up about two o'clock in the morning, comes out and talks to me. And I'm like, that is not my mom. You know, she, she was never, she was never one of those people that would be awake in the middle of the night. So that was different, but I've got, friends guests people that contact me on social media and it's like it's like it's like toddlers like nighttime battles it's like no it's two o'clock in the morning you need to be in bed and they're trying to go out the front door and there's tricks for avoiding them leaving the house but is do you think having this kind of pre bedtime routine for somebody living with alzheimer's is beneficial or is it just their brain chemistry is messed up and you could try but it's, yeah, I think it, you can certainly try and it may help. I think uh, the reality is that, you know, our circadian rhythm, our body's internal clock, that's governed by the brain. And so if you now have brain issues um, and brain dysfunction, then there's a good chance that that's going to be thrown off as well. That makes sense. That's just, ugh, that's the word. It's so hard for caregivers who are, you know, they need their sleep and their loved one is not sleeping and ugh, it's just not, it's adds more challenges to the already challenging diagnosis. And then there was one thing we were talking about stress. I really, I don't dwell on it because that's obviously not good for my brain, but I worry that this year, 2020 with everything that's gone on, yeah. I, I would not be surprised if they see, an acceleration in the diagnosis of Alzheimer's in more people, like the, the number, the percentage will increase more quickly just because yeah. people have been not having um, socialization. Their routines have been disrupted. It's been stressful. It's been confusing. It's just never ending. It's just like, you know, it's, it's, it's a really terrible thing to think about. I think it'll be, you know, maybe for people in research might find it interesting. They're going to have more subjects, I think. But, you know, do you have tips on what people should be doing right now in this insanity? Yeah. And so I've seen more people who are reporting either that they're starting to have memory problems over the last uh, few months or that their cognitive issues have gotten worse over the last few months. And the reality is that if people are sad, if people are depressed, that that can bring out um, a lot of symptoms associated with dementia. And in fact, when people are really depressed and they present with memory problems, cognitive issues, we call that pseudo dementia. Mm. And so, you know, so we do see that. The reality is that the mindset that we take into things has a huge impact on how we come out of them and has a huge impact on our health overall. So there are people that are, in this time period, which is a really difficult time period, um, who feel completely hopeless, who are just like, I just want things to go back to normal already, <laughs> you know? And then there are other people who are gonna say, look, 
this is a really great opportunity for me, well, one, first to stay healthy, but to reevaluate the things that were working and not working in my life and make some changes. It's a great opportunity to spend with family. Uh, it's a great opportunity to, to work on that business or that project I've always wanted to. And so the mindset that we have is incredibly important because the mindset often dictates not just our thoughts, but the actions that we take. That's true. Okay? And then you're going to have people, let's say next year, things are completely back to normal. <laughs> You'll have a group of people that are like, man, I wish it was 2020 and I had time, more time with my family again. Right? That's so, probably true, but it's hard. It's, I'm laughing just because it's like, oh, Lord. Yeah. So, you know? you know, so the mindsets that we have are incredibly important. I did learn mindfulness between my mom falling and breaking her leg and her passing away. And I've never, even though I'm like California and like outside nature kind of chick, never been one of those woo woo mindfulness people, but I had a guest and he explained it in ways that actually made sense to me. And I, I have repeated this story a couple of times, but I, I feel like it's super important to repeat, but my mom was in the hospital. She didn't even know she broke her leg. And so that's how far into the Alzheimer's she was. She had it for about 20 years. So we were definitely at the end prior to breaking the leg. And, you know, so I'm trying to explain to her why she can't get out of bed. And, you know, all that was stressful. And it was right at the beginning of the pandemic. And it's like, do I want her in the hospital? And do I want me over here visiting? It was like, well, it was just, you know, and then you're talking to the surgeon and you probably know surgeons like to do surgery. And so when the surgeon didn't push fixing the broken leg, um, I was like, oh, this is great. But of course, you know, they leave it up to you because that's, that's the way it has to be. And I was walking across the room from the kitchen to the master bedroom. And I could literally feel the stress just winding up like a spring and I knew what was coming. I was going to explode. There was going to be a fight with the spouse. And it was going to be ugly. And I was like, wait, you know, this guy, this is what he told me to do. He's like, embrace the feeling. Don't try to pretend you're not feeling like you're about to explode. So I, I did. I said, okay, I'm really, really angry. Why am I angry? And in literally 30 seconds, it was like, oh, it's just because I want the best thing for my mom. And I went literally from nanoseconds away from exploding and just being an unreasonable, not pleasant person to be around to feeling really good about myself. And so I repeat that story because it can be that easy. It's like once you understand why you're feeling this really negative emotion, instead of trying to shove it away and pretend, no, I'm not angry or I'm not upset, you know, that it's, it's much easier to just go, oh yeah, I'm, I'm really upset because I want the best for my mom. And, and that was the, that was in the middle of March. So <laughs> that I had to keep doing that as every vacation we had this year, including two weeks in Hawaii got canceled. So, and it's like, okay, well, you know, it is what it is. I revamped my website. I reached out to more people for the podcast, which was a couple crazy weeks and you know, I'm a planner, so this is really hard for me, but it's just like, well, this is just the way it is right now. It will not be like this forever. There are days I feel that way, and then there are days I just have to remind myself that, hey, you know, we're into September already. We've managed this far into the year. We can just keep moving forward. So it is really possible to, to really shift your mind focus if you just learn how to do it. And I'll, I will put that episode that I'm talking about it is called mindfulness and the link to his courses along with yours in the show notes. So everybody can learn all this good stuff. So that's a good segue into the course that you did. <laughs> yeah. So the course is called take charge of your brain in 30 days and it launches uh, this Monday, September 7th. And so, you know, I, I always say that our brains are completely out of control if we allow them to be right. I mean, have you, and you sort of just gave a really, uh, a great example of that when you said, you know, you were feeling a kind of way, you knew that you were about to explode on your spouse, <laughs> right? And it's like, if you have one bad moment, or somebody pisses you off in that moment, all of a sudden, your brain takes you down a road where it's like, you start to acknowledge everything that's wrong in the world, everything that's wrong with that person, everything that's wrong with you, 
and you just get really, really angry. And that happens with, with all of us. Um, and that's sort of our brains being completely just out of control. And I often tell people that our brains need us to lead them. And when we take charge of our brains, that's when we're really able to create the lives uh, that we truly want for ourselves. And so the way that the course is organized, it's organized into uh, more than 70 lessons spread across, across four modules. And the first module is really talking to people about the importance of having a mission, vision, and purpose, despite what their diagnosis may be. The second module talks to people about the impact that preventable chronic diseases have on their brains and all the things that influence their health in general. The third module is, is uh, teaching people to have a completely different relationship with their brain, to become the leader that their brain needs them to be. Um, and they also learn about neurological disorders. And then in the fourth module, uh, people learn how to create their own sort of prescription plan, but rooted in the development of their mind, body, and soul in order to become healthy and create the lives that they want. As part of the course, people also, um, we do uh, two hours per week, so one hour on Mondays, one hour on Thursdays of live group coaching sessions with me. So we go over the, the course content, we do uh, question and answer sessions, and people get access to the course for a full year. And who would you recommend do this course besides everybody? <laughs> so this is really tailored for people who have neurological issues. I think everybody can benefit, but right now we're ta tailoring it to people with neurological issues. Yeah. So and as I, re I recall from the website, it was strokes and anxiety. I forgot what else I'd written down but it was, it listed a lot of things. So. Yeah. You know, and, and even people with preventable chronic um, medical issues, right? Because high blood pressure and diabetes often lead to neurological problems, but whether it's stroke, epilepsy, back pain, headaches, MS, Parkinson's, um, you know, all of those people can, can benefit. I know somebody with MS. She's running for mayor of our town. She's been a city council person for four years. So I will, I will mention your course to her. She's doing fine. The, um, she has to be careful about getting overly tired and overly stressed because we've discussed why those are bad for your brain. And then I was going to ask, high blood pressure is bad for your brain because it reduces the oxygenated blood that's flowing to your brain. Is that correct? Yeah, so, you know, the smallest blood vessels in your brain cannot tolerate high blood pressure or high blood sugar or inflammation very well. So over time, those things damage those small blood vessels, which means that now there are areas of your brain that are not getting the blood flow that they need. So they're not getting the oxygen and nutrients that they need. And that causes injury. And we can see that on CAT scans and MRIs. And also, high blood pressure can lead to strokes it can also lead to bleeding in the brain. And you know, when you have those, that kind of injury, it can lead to dementia, uh, like a vascular dementia. Um, diabetes uh, has been linked to Alzheimer's like we talked about. So this stuff has a really negative impact on the brain. I've learned a lot about the brain doing this podcast and taking care of my mom. And I wish I'd started the podcast a lot sooner because I learned a lot that would have been beneficial earlier in her, her journey, yeah. but better late than never. It's benefiting me because uh, in my prior to this year, I was a professional portrait photographer and I could do most of that job without thinking about it. Cause I'd been doing it for like 29 years mm -hmm. and I loved it. It was creative and you know, I liked being with the people and that was my thing and I didn't want to give it up, but the pandemic kind of moving and the pandemic and I'm like you know what I'm just done people like to change their appointment time constantly and I'm just I finally said I'm done I'm retiring I'm sticking to the podcast it's much easier and in the two and a half years I've been doing the podcast I've learned so many things from guests how to produce the podcast how just everything involved with putting this out to the world and it's really interesting because had I not gone down this path, I don't think I would have created as many new neurons as I think I've probably done 
you know, I'm always reading stuff on Alzheimer's, although some of them are like, could they, could they put this in English? This is very scientific <laughs> and I'm not very good with those kind of things. So I don't want to take up too much more of your time. I'm going to have all of your links to, you know, to the website and everything in the app in the show notes, but do you have one last bit of advice that you would give people like maybe like the caregivers? I have both family caregivers and professional caregivers that listen. Yeah. And so I think it's really important that caregivers take good care of themselves first and foremost. You cannot take care of anybody else unless you're taking care of yourself first. You can't give to other people unless you are filling yourself up um, first. And I think that that's really important for caregivers. We often see caregivers that are emotionally and physically exhausted or they're getting physically hurt um, trying to carry somebody or move somebody or, you know, or somebody's combative. <laughs> so My mom got combative. It's really, really important for caregivers to take exceptional care of themselves, take time out every day for themselves. Even if you have to do it in five minute increments, because especially right now, my friend with the father with Louie body dementia, he doesn't like it if they're not in the same room. So sometimes if he's not occupied or there's not an in-home caregiver or he's at the adult day program, she has a hard time going to, to the bathroom or taking a shower. And so, you know, I've, yeah. I've given her suggestions via my guests for that because that's, that's exhausting. I have a dog. Yeah. That is important. It's just very difficult. Yeah. So I appreciate this very much. I'm going to check out, like I said, I'm going to check out the app since it's got a Candy Crush-esque kind of vibe and show it to my husband this evening. And I really appreciate you taking the time to share your knowledge and, and information with all my listeners. Well, thank you for having me. This has been fun. So thank you. You're welcome. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.